We're thankful for your presence with us this morning. Thank you for being here. Your decision to be present at this gathering is commendable, showing that you have put a priority on spiritual things, and you're to be commended for that. This is not the time for personal confession, but let me ask you, have you ever used a screwdriver as a chisel? Or a treadmill as a clothes rack? Maybe your toothbrush to clean grout? Or your credit card as an ice scraper? Maybe a bucket instead of a step stool? Sometimes we might use things in ways that were never intended by those who designed them to be used in that way. We can abuse things when we force them to be used for something they were never designed to be used for. And this is exactly what happened in the Old Testament. It's demonstrated by the name Nehushtan. If you don't immediately recognize that, don't feel bad. It's only used one time in all of the Bible in only one verse. And so it's somewhat of an obscure name. So you may or may not already know what that signifies. Although not matching the Hebrew and the English, it's commonly pronounced Nehushtan. That's how I'll be saying it. We'll be looking at the specific reference later on in our lesson, but the Bible records that this is the name that was given to the serpent that Moses set up on the standard in the wilderness. But it reveals some important things from which we can learn. Nehushtan can remind us that a good thing can become a God thing. We'll start by looking at the background of this in Numbers chapter 21. This is in a time when God has delivered the Hebrew nation from Egyptian slavery. He has miraculously saved them from the Egyptians. They have walked through the Red Sea on dry ground. But then after a lack of faith in God to give them the victory in the land of Canaan, they begin wandering in the wilderness. And this is where they are now. God's people are wandering in the wilderness. They have been there for about 39 years, and so they're reaching the end of their journey. They're currently camped at Kadesh, northeast of Mount Hur. But God is still with them. He's still leading them, and they can see that pillar of smoke in the day and the pillar of fire at night. He's still speaking to them through his servant Moses. And God has been providing for them throughout this whole journey. Water, manna, quail. He's taking care of every need they have. According to Numbers chapter 20, the people were ready now to move through the land of Edom. In verses 40, uh, 14 through 21, we find that Moses had sent messengers to the king of Eden asking for permission to go through their land. And the king refused. And so they're going to take a detour. As a result, in Numbers 21.4, the Bible says from Mount Hur, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And so we learn that they first needed to go south from Mount Hur to the northeast tip of the Red Sea and then travel around Edom in the barren desert. And that's where God's people are at this time in history. And they are walking through a land that is hot, that is sandy and rocky, and very often has sandstorms. With that background, let's first notice the reason for the serpent. We find the reason behind the creation of this brazen serpent in Numbers 21. Beginning in the last part of verse 4, we read, And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. 
the people begin to murmur against God and against Moses. And I find it interesting they first say there's no food. There's no water, but then immediately, as the NIV words it, we detest this miserable food. (laughs) We don't have any food, but, well, yes, we have food. We just don't like this food. God is still providing manna, but they speak out against his provisions. And God was not pleased with this. Verse 6 says, Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, And they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. Here we find the reason behind the serpent that is about to be made. It is their complaints. They are murmuring against God. They're not satisfied with what he has provided. Their hearts are turned against the divine provider. They were rejecting God, murmuring against his goodness. We don't have much information about these fiery serpents. All we know is that they're called fiery. And that may indicate, sometimes the word fiery just means red, so maybe they were uh, red in color on their skin. Or it may refer to the pain of the bite. It may have been that the victims felt like they had been burned when they were bitten. But because of these serpents, the text says that many people died. We don't know what the number was, but it was significant. The people had brought this punishment upon themselves. They were dying. Why? Because of their own complaints. And that should remind us that when God gives us what we need, we need to have hearts filled with gratitude. As we move on in the text, we also find the purpose of the serpents. Because of these deadly, fiery serpents, the people cry out to Moses. Look at verse 7. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it up on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. When they cried out to God, God heard them and he acted. And notice the people acknowledged what they did was sinful. They had done what was not pleasing in God's sight. So they asked for the serpents to be removed. And God didn't remove the serpents. They stayed. God also didn't make the snakes less dangerous. He didn't provide an immunity to the snake bites. The text says if a serpent bite anyone, the serpents would still bite, and death would still be the result. They had an immediate and present reminder of their complaints against God, and the consequences still remain. And yet in this section, we discover the purpose of this bronze serpent, which was a cure. This was God's means of salvation. Through his mercy, God gave them a way to be spared. And they would certainly die unless they followed God's plan of salvation. Obedience was essential to this cure. We might not understand fully why God would require this. Why would he instruct that this bronze serpent be set up and put on a pole in the middle of the camp? Perhaps it was a test of faith. Did they trust in God's word that they would be willing to look on the serpent to do what God said to do in order to enjoy salvation? Because the only way for them to be saved was by doing what God had said. In spite of this, the fiery serpents are still among the people, and yet he provided a way of salvation. And so the purpose of the serpent was to bring a physical cure. But remember, this was a specific purpose for a specific time. It was set up by God's express direction for those people who were there at that time, who were facing death, 
through these serpents, but something happened with that serpent that was never intended. We'll now fast forward in time and find the worship of the serpent. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 2 Kings. When we turn to 2 Kings, this is now hundreds of years later. God's people have finished their wandering in the wilderness. They've gone in and conquered the promised land. They've gone through the period of the judges and the kings of the United Kingdom, and now we're living in the time of the divided kingdom. And so this is much, much later in history, getting close to a 1,000 years later. And we find that Hezekiah is now the new king in Israel. He's one of the good kings who is also a great reformer in the land. Let's begin reading in 2 Kings 18, verse 1. In the third year of Hoshea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all that David, his father, had done. He removed the high places and broke the pillars and cut down the Asherah. And he broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the people had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. In verse 4, we find the name that is the title of our lesson, Nehushtan. The ESV footnote says, Nehushtan sounds like the Hebrew for both bronze and serpent. The name itself appears to mean a brazen thing or a piece of brass. After all of this time, after all the history that have gone by, Nehushtan was still among the people. They still had this brazen serpent. It wasn't a reproduction. This is the original serpent. And no doubt it still signified healing to them. They could remember how their ancestors were saved from destruction through the setting up of this serpent. But verse 4 records that the people had turned this good thing into a God thing. They had started worshiping it, treating it like an idol. The ESV said they made offerings to it. Other versions are more literal when they indicate they had been burning incense to it. The same Hebrew word is translated in other passages of the Old Testament as to offer up in smoke. In addition, notice the Bible says, until those days. And from that phrase, we get the idea that for a long time, they had been burning incense to this brazen serpent. They had a history of worshiping this image. And so here we find the worship of the serpent indicating spiritual corruption. They were using the serpent for something it was never intended to be used for. We know that the creation of this serpent was commanded by God. Moses was told to make this, to set it up for the people's benefit, and so it was divinely authorized, but they had corrupted it. A bronze serpent on a stick. That's what it was. And that's all it was. Just a brazen thing. But they were treating it like it was more than that. And that's why Hezekiah broke it into pieces. God had blessed the people, but their focus was directed away from God. It was placed on the physical thing that Moses had set up. What was the source of their salvation became a source of separation from God. But the same thing can happen in our lives. It's sad that in the minds of many people, idolatry is something that is just in the Old Testament. I mean, we don't have idolatry anymore. But that isn't the case. The idea of Nehushtan is still very present in our world today. For example, in 1 Corinthians 5.10, in a list of sins that shouldn't be tolerated in the church is the term idolaters. 
In 1 Corinthians 10, 14, Paul told those in the Corinthian church, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Well, who is Paul's audience? It is Christians. It is those under the New Testament system, just like you and I. And he warned them about idolatry. When John ends his first epistle, the last thing he says is, little children, keep yourselves from idols. In regard to this, Marvin Vincent in his word studies writes of this word idol and says strictly images. The command, however, has apparently the wider Pauline sense to guard against everything which occupies the place due to God. Vincent reminds us that anything that takes the place of God can be an idol. We may not offer incense to it, but that doesn't mean we don't allow other things to take the place that God deserves. There can be things to which we give our devotion in the same way that an idol worshiper devotes to his God. Let's briefly consider a few idols in our world today and be reminded of the need we have to flee idolatry. One common idol today is that of money. It should come as no surprise that money can become our Nehushtan. There's nothing inherently wrong with money. We can use it for great good in the service of God. In fact, so many of our efforts in the church are limited by funding. And if we just had more money, we could do more good. And yet listen to the inspired words we find in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Paul writes, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. A greedy desire to have more, which is the definition of covetousness, is a sinful lust that is idolatry. We can put our desire for money higher than, than our devotion to God, and it can become an idol for us. In 1 Timothy 6.10, we're warned that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and have pierced themselves through with many pangs. The love of money can be strong enough to pull us away from God and begin serving it as our master. 2 Timothy 3.2 tells us we can become lovers of money. Our world is filled with, we are surrounded by money lovers. We need to be very careful we do not join them in their idolatry. Another common idol today is that of pleasure. Again, there's nothing wrong with pleasure in and of itself. God created us with the ability to experience it and ways that we can enjoy pleasure. But we witness this as an idol all around us nearly every day. People in the world have every thought and every dollar spent on things that bring them pleasure. They're working in the week, but only for the evening and the weekend for their own gratification. Pleasure must be kept in its proper place and not be something for which we live. 2 Timothy 3, 4 speaks about people who are lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. The word rather here is defined as what is opposed to something else and does away with it. It tells us that our love of pleasure can supplant God and become our idol. Adam Clark's commentary notes, this is nervously and beautifully expressed in the Greek. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, that is, pleasure, sensual gratification is their God, and this they love and serve, God they do not. This describes people who have made pleasure their idol. It is their nehushtan. Another common idol is family, and certainly we would agree that family is a great blessing from God. It's something he established, and so it is a good thing. But we need to be on guard that family does not become something 
that it was never intended to become. In 1 Samuel 2, verse 29, the prophet brought the words of God to Eli and told him, you honor your sons above me. Those were God's words. That was a serious charge. Eli had elevated his family to a place that was higher than God's, and God is saying, you can't do that. Yet how many modern parents in the church do the same? How many place a greater emphasis on the secular things of their children above their service to God? In Matthew 10, verse 37, Jesus recognized this danger. And he says, whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whosoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. We can devote to our family what rightly belongs to God. What about when Christians forsake the assembly in order to feed and to entertain family that has come into town? We need to be very careful. Another modern idol is self. Again, this is something that's a good thing, but it can become a God thing. Paul was not being complimentary when in 2 Timothy 3, 2, he speaks about people who are lovers of self. He was talking about things to avoid. Now, that doesn't mean we can't have a healthy concern for ourselves. There's nothing wrong with enjoying, as we say today, some me time. But for so many people, me time becomes all the time. We can be so focused on ourselves, we have no attention left to direct to God. Jesus teaches in Luke 9, verse 23, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. We're called to deny self, not to be constantly focused on and pampering self. As Christians, we should have made the decision at the point of conversion to live for Jesus. But it's possible for us to reverse that decision and go back again to serving ourselves, doing what we want instead of what he wants. Maybe we should be reminded to be steadfast in our commitment to the Lord. Remember what Paul writes in Galatians 2 verse 20. He has been crucified with Christ. No longer he that lives, but Christ lives in him. We have crucified self. Let's not let a good thing become a God thing. There are many other possible idols. Entertainment, personal appearance, comfort, relationships, technology, employment, status, and the list goes on and on. So how do we identify a possible idol in our lives? Let me suggest three that will indicate this usually. We can ask, what gets the most of my attention? What do we think about all the time? What occupies our minds? Number two, what gets our affections? Where do we find our greatest joy? Where do we find the most satisfaction? And number three, our energies. Where do we devote the most of ourselves? Is it in the service of God or something else? There are many things that can corrupt our dedication to God that can become our nehushtan. Let's not let that occur in our lives. As we bring the lesson to a close, let's consider now the New Testament and look at the likeness of the serpent. In John chapter 3, we find Jesus having a conversation with Nicodemus. The two are having a discussion Jesus tells Nicodemus about the new birth and about the coming kingdom. And in John 3, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? This man would have studied the Old Testament. He would have known about the fiery serpents and God's plan through the serpent being lifted up to save the people. 
And because of this, in John chapter 3, verse 14, Jesus says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, in order that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. In the Old Testament, physical healing was available through the lifting up of the serpent. But in the New Testament, we can have, through the lifting up of Jesus, not physical salvation, not even spiritual salvation, but eternal salvation. We're familiar with verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. That's why Jesus was lifted up. Today, whoever complies with God's plan of salvation will be saved. Remember, with Nehushtan, nobody had to perish. They could look at the serpent that Moses set up, and they could be saved. No one had to perish. Under the New Testament system, because of Christ, no one has to perish eternally. Through the sacrifice of Jesus, we can be freed from the punishment of our sins. And so there are great lessons in these passages for us. Lessons that bring great teaching. As we look at the New Testament, what about Jesus? Jesus is the one who brings salvation to all who will obey. We need to recognize it's possible for us to take something good and use it in a way that God never intended, turning that good thing into a God thing. Today, are we keeping a serpent somewhere? Do we have our Nehushtan? It's getting all of our attention, all of our devotion, all of our time that should be devoted to God. Nehushtan, with a New Testament perspective, it's not about a serpent. It's about the Savior. It's about Jesus being lifted up for all men to be saved. It's ultimately about life that will extend beyond the grave. In the Old Testament, God didn't take away the serpents. Today, God doesn't take away temptation. Back then, God didn't make them immune to snake bites, and he doesn't make us immune to temptation. What God does is provide a way of salvation. Today, that way is to look to the one who was lifted up on the cross. Today, if you haven't looked to Jesus for your salvation, today is the time. Today is the time for you to get rid of all of the other idols that may be in your life, And devote yourself to Jesus. Maybe you've done that, but you've allowed other things, even good things, to draw you away from your dedication to Christ. Today's the time to come back. If you need to get rid, to break in pieces your Nehushtan, and look to the one who was lifted up on the cross, why don't you do that today, even right now, as together we stand and sing, will you come? When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no Yeah.
and you're dismissed. Our God, our Father in heaven, we are always grateful for the opportunity to uh, gather uh, together as a body of, of your people and, and worship you. We are so grateful, Father, uh, for the for the privilege it is to be called your people. We're also thankful, Father, for uh, your word uh, that we can come together uh, every week and and study. Uh, learn a, b a bit more about. We're grateful, Father, that your word is uh, consistent and never changing. That, uh, that, that that as we learn more about you, uh, it is uh, the same and uh, will always be the same. We're we're grateful, Father, for the the cl clarity of uh, the uh, how your word is so clear. Um, that uh, you have made clear who you are to us through your word, that you have made uh, clear who you, uh, your son is as our Savior. We pray, Father, that as we uh, look through the scriptures this morning, that we can understand that you are the only one that is worthy and deserving of our praise, of our uh, devotion. We pray, Father, that uh, we can uh, always uh, hold that uh, in our mind, that, that we can only, uh, that we'll understand to only worship and, and dedicate our lives to you, that, uh, that we understand your, your son is the only one uh, who we can turn to as our Savior. We're grateful, Father, for this congregation here that, that we can uh, assist one another in our spiritual walk. We can assist one another in, in understanding uh, and acknowledging you as our God and recognizing your Son as our Savior. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>